Uh, good evening, all out there. Uh, welcome to the sixth Selborn College Old Selbornian Association webinar, which is part of our 150 Jubilee celebration. I'm Chris Sanford. I'm employed at Selborn College as head of geography department and head of sport. I've been at Selborn College for 36 years. The theme of the webinar is veterinary, farming, and the allied industries. We will get thoughts from all Subordians who are in the field of veterinary medicine, farming, and the allied industries. It will be a discussion focused on the boys who may have an interest in a career in veterinary, farming, and the allied industries. The panelists will share their experiences, what they have learned and what they wish and they knew earlier in their career. We request that all attendees to please submit questions during the panelists' presentations. To do so, in the top right hand corner, you'll find there's a chat icon and you can put your requests there and we'll read them over and the panelists will discuss them. Our panelists of Ulsterbornians, whom we are extremely proud of tonight, are Peter Obram, Keir Tilney, Gary Barr, Delwyn Roberts, and Nicholas Andrews. We're going to start tonight's proceedings with Nick Andrews, the youngest matriculant. Uh, Nick Andrews matriculated from Selborne College in 2006, after which he studied landscape design at the Cape Peninsula University of Technology in Cape Town. Graduate in 2011 after taking a one-year sabbatical, which was spent in America. Iowa and Texas were where he worked in a beef feedlot and a game ranch. After graduating, he went back to his family run Abitra and Elliot and has been in the industry ever since. I hand over to Nicholas Andrews to Give us the background. Thank you, Mr. Sanford. Hello, panelists and all our listeners. Uh, just to give you a, a brief intro, besides what Mr. Sanford just said, um, to all the listeners that aren't quite sure of what they want to do after school, I'd encourage you to try and get into the most difficult degree that your marks would allow. Uh, if you aren't sure, it'll be a broader opportunity to choose once you are sure. I unfortunately didn't do that, um, studying landscape design, which is rather specific. Uh, but fortunately, I, I did have the opportunity to, to go back to a successful family business, which I've made a career out of and was fortunate enough, enough to, to enjoy making a career out of. Um, after coming back from the States, just to cut my teeth in the, in the industry, my father sent me to Claremont, which was an abattoir just outside of East London, uh, which was owned by our partners, which were shareholders in our abattoir in Elliot. Uh, there I learned um, the basic meat classifications. I was put on the slaughter floor and learned a basic, um, just basic training in sales and slightly um, a little bit of buying as well. Once I'd cut my teeth there and my father felt I was uh, prepared enough to go back and, and run the abattoir in Elliot, uh, I went back and soon enough found my feet. And once, the, well, the abattoir was a, a pretty well-oiled machine at that time and we felt we just needed to add other businesses and vertically integrate other aspects to the business. Um, so we did we did this by introducing a cattle feedlot and um, as a product of the cattle feedlot growing to around 2,000 head, it warranted us setting up a farming operation, uh, which included growing crops such as maize for silage and maize for grain, together with other crops for raffage such as uh, barley, oats, um, and soya. Um, on the other end of the scale, from a retail perspective, to carry on the vertical integration, we opened up a retail outlet so we basically covered the full chain from growing the feed, uh, growing the animal, slaughtering it at the abattoir and selling the, the product within a five kilometer radius. And um, it took us about 10 years to do that, but it, it certainly did maximize profits. Um, and it was a thoroughly enjoyable process, each of those um, aspects and businesses. Um, 
Yeah, I actually left the abattoir about 18 months ago and uh, took a sabbatical and I'm now consulting at East London Abattoir in obviously in East London. I've been there for just over two weeks and I've just got home after a 14 hour day. But it's lovely to be back in the industry and um, it's taught, taught me a tremendous amount of people skills um, which I, I wouldn't have got got to learn if I wasn't thrown in the deep end at such a young age. Uh, but I've been very fortunate to to have got into this industry with not having studied something relevant to it and was fortunate enough to to love it. Um, so yeah, if there are any questions coming, I look forward to hearing them. Thank you. Yeah, just one question coming in, Nick. I see you, you, you basically did answer a, a, a number of the points here, but your studying of landscape design, did you, you basically said you didn't envisage joining the family, but have you ever used your artistic flair in the landscaping design at all since you've graduated? Uh, I, I did make the abattoir gardens pretty, but my father said it cost him a hell of a lot of money to have pretty gardens at the abattoir. So absolutely haven't used it. Um, I just found that in my practical, uh, just theory, in my, well, when I envisioned what it, what the trade was, uh, I think I had a, a slightly, I don't know, um, yeah, it was completely different to what I envisaged. And I was being told by, um, housewives, how to design small gardens, where, which really wasn't what I wanted to do um, and was just completely, yeah, didn't enjoy it at all. But I, I liked it as a hobby, not as a career. Uh, thanks there, Nick. I don't see any other questions coming up. But we'll proceed and go on to Dalwyn Roberts. Uh, Dalwyn matriculated at Selwyn College in 1993, after which he studied agricultural production at the University of Natal in Peter Maritzburg. He spent two uh, years lambing in, uh, and farming in the United Kingdom and Scotland and returned to the family properties in McClare after that. Dalwyn and his family run commercial beef and sheep enterprises. Uh, he has a, a Brangus stud herds, and he's also involved, which I wasn't aware of, in a cattle ranching operation in Zimbabwe. I uh, hand over to Delwyn. Okay, hi. Yes, uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, yes, yeah, so that's where we started, five years Norton House, uh, three years running with Mr. Sanford. Um, yes, and 29 years ago we matriculated. Uh, it doesn't feel that it's, it doesn't feel it's gone very quickly. Uh, after that, four years BSc uh, agricultural production, and then yes, worked overseas for a while, which was excellent uh, because they that was just after apartheid, and we had been through just come through sanctions, and that Europe at that stage was well ahead of South Africa. I don't think they are now, but at that stage they definitely were, and at least it gave us it gave us a look at where where agriculture is going. So you could come into this and you could almost model what we saw there um, and cut and paste back in South Africa. So it was it, it was a great advantage. So and um, so yes, I came back to a family run business, a well run business. Um, it was doing very well at the time. Uh, my dad was unwell and I was thrown in the deep end. Um, Coming back to a family run business, anyone wanting to get into agriculture, it, it is complicated. It's not easy. It takes a lot of time to get to get in. There's um, yes, there's a lot of nitty gritty and there's things you need to, to work through that everybody gets on and everybody knows exactly where you stand. And I think that's what's what's most important is that everybody at the end of the day, everybody everybody respects everybody and the business carries on. So yes, we run we run a cattle operation and a sheep operation, uh, a fairly intensive sheep operation. Um, lambing in, uh, in autumn, uh, we run Dooney Merinos, which are a mutton breed and uh, a wool breed. Um, quite intensive lambing, all in all in hogs, quite high percentages, and it works very well. We fatten all our own lambs and produce 95% of the concentrates we use in our feedlots are produced on farm. So we've got a mechanical sector that does all of that. 
but our main operation is our cattle operation. Um, yeah, we run the two stud herds, and they their purpose is to produce bulls for our commercial herds. Um, the, our main stud is our Banger stud. Uh, they are a, a very good beef breed. Um, the Charolais stud has a purpose. We use them as a terminal crossbreed. Um, uh, and so we'll mate for two months with Brangus bulls, take the Brangus bulls out and follow up with Charolais bulls for the last month and cull all progeny. So that's very basically it. But how things have changed, how things have changed over the years. Um, a lot more money was spent in agriculture at one stage. There were, you could afford to spend money on lands and cattle could run on lands, but we've moved away from that. So uh, agriculture, uh, has it, it is fairly tight. So um, yeah, so much more leg programs, much. So one has to look at one's bottom line a lot more than was necessary probably 20, 30 years ago. Um, yeah, if you're looking, if you're looking to enter agriculture, it, well, I just have to understand it is fairly, you, you need a fairly broad uh, skill set. So from livestock, you'll have to look at nutrition, um, selecting animals, animal health. Um, from the crop point of view, it's the machinery, soil mach uh, machinery maintenance, uh, soil nutrition, varieties that, you're, that you'll be using. And besides all of that, there's building, uh, waterworks, fencing, so it's it's very broad, which makes it exciting. But what is most important, I'd say, in agri any business, not agriculture only, is actually one's ability to to look after one's staff, look after one's managers, and make sure that everybody can work in a harmonious environment, uh, so that the business actually carries on. Um, yeah. It, Crop speaking, things are moving forward pretty rapidly at the moment. Uh, with precision, it's precision fertilizer spreading, uh, uh, GPS planting, tractors driving themselves, and all kinds of things. So we're in an exciting place. Um, yes, and so that's yeah. So that's us in a nutshell. Mr. Sanford, Mr. Sanford, you're mute. Uh, sorry, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Gary Barr matriculated in 1984. He completed his veterinary degree uh, from Honest Report in 1990. Gary specialized with a degree in veterinary uh, anthropology in Zurich in 1994, after which he opened an eye clinic the first discipline specialist vet practice in South Africa. He served as the chairman of the Cape Hunters and Game Conservation Association. He's president of the Confederation of Hunters Association of South Africa, president of the South African Veterinary Council, and also the chairman of the investigation committee and the national board member of the South African Veterinary Council. Gary started Gondwana Wildlife Services in Tabazimbi in 210. And one of his many talents later in life is that he's a talented archer. And Gary, congratulations on the numerous awards this year. He's also won the South African Indoor Archery National Championships, the South African National Field National Championships, and a regional field archery championship this year. And he also congratulations on your selection to represent uh, South Africa at the World Field Archery Championships in Estonia in August. I hand over to Gary. Mr. Stanford, thanks very much. Uh, really appreciate those words of introduction and, and good to see the old boys and um, good to, to discuss with the attendees. We can't see you, but uh, hopefully you'll be getting some useful information uh, from what you're hearing this evening, we've. Um, I remember sitting up in one of the lecture halls at the at the old building at school, and Mr. Band that organised career evenings and guidances and stuff like that. And it was it was certainly a far shot from having uh, 26 people attending online and watching things online. I think that was before computers even were around in the country. So things have come a long way um, since then. 
Um, I prepared a video um, in case I couldn't present this evening because of load shedding or any other power outage that we have up here where I'm living. Um, it happens fairly commonly and, uh, and I was probably a 50-50 chance that I would have been able to connect online this evening. So I prepared a video which gives a very general um, insight into veterinary science as a career. Um, what the opportunities are, what the requirements are for entry into universities and uh, and where you can work in the world um, once you've graduated at Ornisworth at the University of Pretoria. Um, so I'm not going to go into that into too much detail, but what I was asked to do uh, was rather to share my own first-hand experience of what's happened with me since I left school. Um, and I managed to secure, uh, based on, on the academic achievements which, uh, which Selborne gave me, I managed to secure a Foundation for Research Development scholarship or grant which allowed me to study in Zurich in Switzerland for three years. And I specialized in, in veterinary ophthalmology, which is the study and, uh, and surgery and treatment of, uh, of eyes. And I came back to South Africa and started the Animal Eye Clinic in Cape Town uh, soon after that, as you heard. Um, that clinic uh, then eventually grew to become uh, not only a, um, a discipline-specific speciality center, but it grew to become a, a multidisciplinary um, specialist center, which included uh, small animal medicine, small animal surgery, theriogenology, which is which is breeding uh, breeding of animals um, or assisted breeding. Um, dentistry, homeopathy, and then we had an in-house laboratory as well. And uh, my whole drive and reason, believe it or not, of uh, trying to get that clinic up and going and, and choosing ophthalmology as, as, the, as the niche that I chose was to try and earn enough money quickly enough to be able to buy a farm and just become a farmer before I became too old to do that. And uh, after 10 years of paying off student loans, 18 years of living in a city in Cape Town, I realized that that wasn't going to happen. And uh, I closed the doors of the eye clinic in 2010 and moved up to Tabazimbi in Limpopo and started a species specific clinic, which is, which is wildlife. And I've been doing uh, wildlife since, uh, since 2010. Um, I think probably the big attraction, and you'll hear from, from another colleague of mine in a couple of minutes, probably the big attraction of vet science is that you've got uh, unhindered possibilities of what you can do and what you can work with. Um, probably the most important thing that I'd like to, to stress to tonight, and I, and I did stress it in that video that I provided, which I believe will be on the YouTube link um, for this webinar, but um, if you choose vet science because you don't want to work with people and you really love animals, you probably won't last, in, certainly not in private practice. Um, you work probably 80% of your time with people and 20% of your time with animals. And you've got to certainly have an affinity and an empathy for animals, but not a love and adoration which would blind the science and the medicine behind it. So the two important factors, if, you, if you're wanting to do vet science, and I don't know whether Dr. Obram will agree with me later, is, is that you need to have a, a strong calling towards science and, and medicine. Um, and then the animal side of it comes as a, as a part after that. So even within the wildlife industry um, and within wildlife medicine, uh, there are various aspects that one can go into. You can go into conservation medicine, you can go into private practice. Um, there's a big drive at the moment um, of a term or, or of a movement called the One Health concept where um, veterinarians, um, human medical practitioners, conservationists, ecologists are all starting to realize that these disciplines need to work together to ensure the health of, first of all, the environment, um, secondly, the animals that live in it, and then after that, um, the, that will then ensure the health of the people that live in those environments. So that One Health concept is becoming uh, very, very important. Um, and in South Africa, there's a very big drive now um, to try and provide a good quality um, primary health animals uh, or veterinary, uh, a primary veterinary health service to the to the animals in in areas where 
where uh, private practices are not um, are not really easily available. Um, I hope I've covered what I can, and my time is just about out. But please, uh, any of you that are still at Selborne and any other scholars, I don't know if the other schools that are watching this as well, but if any of you are interested in doing veterinary science, um, the Faculty of Veterinary Science at the University of Pretoria is where you can do it. And then if you wanting to study abroad, the, the decision should be to go to uh, England or the UK, Australia and New Zealand. Uh, those three countries have reciprocity with South Africa, so you can come back and work here without having to do board exams. And likewise, if you if you graduate here, you can work in those countries without having to do their board exams as well. I hope that gives a little bit of insight into it. And, and with the with the video that's going to be on YouTube, I think it'll be a lot more comprehensive. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, obviously, if you're watching this video, it means that our country's uh, blocked our communications this evening, either by load shedding or some other means um, to stop us meeting virtually. Um, I've been asked to talk a little bit about veterinary science as a career um, for students and scholars um, matriculating from Selborne College. And uh, <clears throat> I'd like to thank uh, the school for asking me to do this. It's a great privilege. And a great honor and i hope that i can give you some insight into into the career that uh, that i chose um veterinary science is probably one of the most diverse um, career paths that one can choose once you've graduated the world is really at your feet and uh, and you can choose just about any any path in any field that you'd like some of the fields that are covered by veterinary science uh, are obviously research opportunities um, academia, <clears throat> one can go into industry, um, be that animal feed production, um, medications, um, substitutes, um, vaccinations, etc. Um, <clears throat> one can uh, go into disease control, which is becoming more and more important, as we've seen now recently with outbreaks of uh, monkeypox and, uh, and COVID as well. Um, one can go into the state veterinary service, um, which is uh, which is vital at the moment in uh, in South Africa. Um, and then, what very few people know about recently, there's been the concept of One Health that has developed, and this includes um, veterinarians, um, people from the human medical field, etc. Where we've come to realise that in most of the world, um, the health of animals leads to the health of people um, and as well as the health of the environment. So one looks at the environment, the animals that live in it, as well as the people that live in it, and that's where the One Health concept comes in. None of us would be able to be here without those vets that have gone into education um, and, and that teach, and that's obviously another field. And then, as we all know, <clears throat> and most of us exposure um, up to up to school leaving age has basically been to veterinarians in in uh, in private practice and or animal welfare, um, and we'll touch on that a little bit later um, in in the talk. Um, what are the basic requirements that I would say are essential uh, for choosing this career path? Um, probably the one that uh, most people don't mention is that you need to be of strong character. Um, there were a number of people in my class um, that graduated with really, really good um, uh, academic uh, achievements, um, but then stopped practicing veterinary science completely within, some of them within about four months, um, some within a year or two, um, because of the stresses placed on them by clients making decisions for their pets and their animals that they didn't really um, agree with. Um, so one needs to be of strong character. You need to be able to manage um, stress and, and handle stress in whichever way you're going to do it efficiently. Um, and then you definitely need to have an affinity um, or an empathy for animals. Um, if you have a pure love and fascination and adoration for animals, that would certainly, it would help. Um, but very often that leads to a conflict in your own minds um, when it comes to some of the decisions that you need to make um, because 
the the decisions that one needs to make, especially in private practice, sometimes contradict a complete love or adoration um, for for an individual animal. Um, however, if you have empathy or affinity, um, there's a difference between those two uh, emotions on there. Um, and then, <clears throat> more importantly than the classic old answer that uh, people get asked or give when they get asked the question, why do you want to become a vet? Generally, it's um, because I love animals and I don't want to work with people. And uh, nothing could be further from the truth. I've already alluded to the necessity for an empathy or, or, or an affinity for animals rather than a pure love and adoration. Um, and then, um, obviously, you're going to work with people. Uh, whichever career path you choose, um, you're going to be working with people more than you probably work with animals. So, um, working with people... You know, and then lastly, <clears throat> the main drive or the main reason to become a veterinarian, I think, has got to be because you've got to have a drive for science and or medicine um, in any combination of those two, those two factors. So I hope I've covered a little bit about that. Um, the studies in South Africa at the moment are done only at one university, and that's at the Faculty of Veterinary Science at the University of Pretoria in Onnesport. Um, the course is now presented um, in English. Um, and uh, the course currently, I think, is about six years long, <clears throat> but it varies depending on how they change and how it's changed in the last 20, 30 years between five and a half and seven years long. Um, and they're heading towards an annual intake of vet students, I believe, of about 200 individuals per year. Um, there is about a, a one in ten acceptance into vet science. Um, so about 10% of the applicants um, get accepted into, into the course of veterinary science. Um, <clears throat> then there's obviously also a community service year, which may or may not be included in that seven or six year course. Um, and the courses are obviously are, are um, self-funded. Um, there's a subsidy by the state and by the university, but one needs to pay for those courses. Now I have heard that the state has now made available um, quite a few bursaries, um, I believe from the Health and Welfare CETA um, for students, <clears throat> and, um, and those can be, can be looked at um, uh, um, as well. Um, what's really nice about the South African course currently also is that you have a 12-month practical um, year, um, generally at the end of the year, obviously, and at the end of the course, and that you can do mostly at the university, but then also with private practices, the state. Um, and you can also even do that overseas. Um, talking about abroad, um, what more and more um, people are doing that want to study vet science that come from South Africa, obviously if finances can afford it, is they're looking at studying um, overseas. Um, and um, the countries currently, um, the UK, Australia and New Zealand, have what we call reciprocity with South Africa. So if you graduate in either in what we call reciprocity with South Africa. So if you graduate in either in any of those countries or in South Africa, you can work in any of the others without having to do their entrance or their or their board exam, their state board exam. Um, <clears throat> and then I, I guess what everybody's wanting to know is how much does a vet get paid? Um, what I can tell you at the moment is that the community service vets are getting paid about fifty thousand a month. Um, that's rand, 50,000 rand a month. In private practice, um, starting off immediately after graduation, you can earn from about um, 20, 25,000 rand per month and upwards. And obviously, if you have your own practice, that's the most um, rewarding financially. Um, and then the salaries in the state, research industry, academia, um, uh, I, I really don't have any insight into, but, but uh, one can make a good living out of veterinary science. Um, I certainly wouldn't say you'll become super wealthy, um, but you'll have, a, you'll have a comfortable life and a, and a very good, uh, fulfilling life, I think. I think most of you want to hear about private practice, um, and I'll, I'll just quickly, before we close off, uh, touch on the, on the various aspects of private practice and the various uh, opportunities. Um, we all know about a general practice veterinarian that, uh, that does everything. Um, the James Herriot type vet that's got a little clinic and services the community and sees to dogs, cats, horses, cattle, everything. 
those types of bets are becoming uh, less and less at the moment. And generally, there's a there's either an interest or a specialization driven um, division between small animal practice and large animal practice uh, to start with. Um, <clears throat> and then once you start looking at uh, at becoming more um, specific in the in the practices that you want to go into, you can look at species special specialization. So you can look at either a an equine clinic um, or a bovine clinic um, or a dog, purely dog clinic, purely cat clinic, exotics clinic, which includes your birds and parrots and, and exotic pets, um, wildlife practice, etc. Um, and then you can also um, specialize along the various disciplines like, uh, like what I did. You can have an eye clinic, ophthalmology, um, there's uh, small animal internal medicine, large animal medicine, uh, small animal internal medicine, large animal medicine, surgery clinics, specializations, neurological clinics, um, theriogenology, which is the breeding um, of animals, those specialities, etc. Um, and then on the more hands off and uh, um, advisory or consultancy type of private practices that you have is uh, the colleagues that um, consult for um, the various industries, the, the animal producing industries uh, like, uh, like pigs, poultry, ostrich industry, crocodile industry, then those that consult to animal nutrition companies, um, environmental consultancy services, and then uh, believe it or not in conservation as well. Vets play a very, very important role in, in conservation. Um, in closing, <clears throat> Um, I think it's important to realize that as veterinarians, um, especially if you're in, in private practice, you are at the beck and call of your clients. So generally you have extremely long days, especially when you're starting to start your practice or you've moved into an area where you're trying to build your practice um, and you do everything um, not to turn any, any clients away. And, and one needs to really watch that because it can become a very draining, um, emotionally depriving time of your life in that practice building um, uh, stages. But once you've settled and, and once you've got your practice built, um, it is an extremely fulfilling um, career and profession. Um, you can literally from South Africa um, at the moment work in, in the UK, Australia, New Zealand without having to do any entrance or board exams. Um, and the rest of the of the world, um, you can obviously um, do their board exams or their veterinary state requirements um, to be able to work in those countries. Should you should you so wish, and and South African graduates are are literally all over the world um, at the moment. There's um, there's lots in uh, in in the UK, Australia, New Zealand, obviously, but then um, there's lots of graduates that make very successful um, careers in in America, in Canada, South America the rest of uh, north of South Africa. So it really opens up um, immense opportunities for you once, uh, once you've studied this. I hope that was insightful. Um, please feel free to contact me um, either by WhatsApp or, or by email. The school will have my details should you wish um, to ask any further questions. What is very important though, and it's a little bit late for the matriculants at the moment, um, is if you are wanting to study vet science is to start doing um, practice visiting from your third or second last year at school as much as what you can. Those letters of referral from vets where you've, uh, where you've seen practice and where you've spent time in your holidays on weekends, etc., are vitally important um, in, your, in your selection or, or in the selection process to, to get um, entry into into honest work to study vet science i wish you all of the very best for for this career if you do choose it and uh, and please feel free to contact me should you get into uh thanks very much gary i appreciate that uh, we're going to move on to pia tilney who matriculated from selborne in 1980 after completing his BSc Civil Engineering at the University of Cape Town in 84, uh, Pierre then in 1990 completed his MBA, also at UCT. And then on that, he returned back to East London in 1991. And in 2007, he worked with the family farm at Shelford Farms at Kids Beach. From 2008 onwards, P 
Pierre worked at Summer Pride Foods, which is a pineapple processing and is involved in is de sorry and involves dealing with 24 farmers who supply the Summer Pride Foods. Pierre has also served on Selborne College governing body for numerous years, including a period as the chairman. I hand over to Pierre. Thanks, Chris or Mr. Stanford. Um, yeah, it's uh, good to be here and uh, interesting that there are a few old Norton House guys on the panel. So that's also good to know. I was, oh, okay. I was fortunate also to have three boys at Solborn, uh, both the primary and the college. So I've sort of stayed connected with Solborn a lot more than maybe most of you, um, which has been fantastic. And I can tell you Solborn's better than it ever was and going from strength to strength with great teachers and better facilities. Um, regarding studying, as, I, as um, Stanford mentioned, I did engineering and MBA, and if I had any advice, I would say you need a bit of, uh, it would have been better to have maybe agricultural education if you're going to go farming. Um, uh, Swarming's become very scientific, um, soil science and uh, this, uh, become, become, it would be valuable to, to have some kind of agricultural education it doesn't have to be varsity maybe even like a sedara or diploma or something also great to go overseas work overseas and to also learn from other farmers even in south africa i think is very valuable um farming has many challenges i think it's been pointed out that you almost you have to know a lot about a lot of things um, unlike in a company where you've got an hr department and you've got an accounts department a lot of farmers have to know everything about everything, including VAT and labor law and chemicals and regulations and markets. Um, so it's challenging. Um, also, there are a lot of risks. Of course, you face weather problems, cost pressures, the war breaks out in Ukraine and fertilizer, trebles, diesel doubles. Um, so it's challenging. What's also happened over time is that um, Farms have got bigger. It's, the economies of scale have come into play. So um, farms have become more corporatized, if you want to call it that. But there are also a lot of positives to farming. Um, often you're your own boss, which is a good thing and a bad thing. Um, uh, obviously, the, being in the outdoors, I think the quality of life, being in nature, is, is a fantastic thing. And I think that makes a lot of people want to go into farming. Great place to bring up kids. But it's also quite creative, I think, in terms of people, you know, you can do what you change the farm. I mean, I've seen vegetable farms become dairy farms, you know, so creativity is quite a big part of it. Um, as Mr. Sanford mentioned, I'm in the pineapple industry, so um, I'm just going to show a quick video, if possible, of just showing us two minutes just what the pineapple industry is about in East London. And we get fruit from the Bathurst area. 90% of our production is exported. Um, we make pineapple juice concentrate. Locally, we supply like liquid fruit, fruit and series and those kind of guys. But as I say, 90% is exported. And the factory is right on the banks of the Buffalo River where I used to row a long time ago when I was at school. Um, so, Luisa, if you can put up the video, please.
Thanks there, Pierre. Uh, our last panelist tonight is Peter Obram. Uh, Peter matriculated from Selborne in 1971. He completed his BS degree in zoology and etymology at Rhodes University in 1975. He followed this up with his BVSC veterinary degree from Honestaport, Faculty of Veterinary Science at Pretoria in 1980. In 1990, he completed his BVSC honors in veterinary parasitology. Starting his career as a state veterinary in the Northwestern Cape, then a research veterinarian in etymology section at the Veterinary Research Institute and Honors Support. He worked a further 10 years in the private animal health pharmaceutical industry, becoming a managing director of Holst Roussel Vet. In 2000, he started his own animal health company, AfriVet, now one of the biggest in Southern Africa. His specialized interests are in game ranching, where he's also served as the president of the wildlife ranching in South Africa for two terms. He has his own game ranch, Dabchik Wildlife Reserve in Limpopo. I hand over to, uh, to Peter Obram. Thank you very much, Chris. Much appreciated. Um, I am a veterinarian. I'm a qualified veterinarian. But when I need help, which is always, I have to call on Dr. Bauer to come and look after my animals, I'm afraid. Uh, being 68 years old and not practiced for the last 20 odd years, um, you sort of lose touch with what you need to do with your hands. In reading my uh, short CV, I think you covered most of what I uh, wanted to say in the beginning of my talk. But I do feel that um, it's important to understand why one does what one does, why one goes into agriculture. And in my case, it was, first of all, because while growing up in East London and at Selborne, I spent most of my holidays with, on my grandparents' farm in the Free State. It was a mixed farm with wool sheep, dairy cattle and maize. It was here that my love for agriculture and my future career direction was born. At Rhodes, as you said, I did entomology together with zoology. Now, entomology is the study of insects and who actually on in their sane mind would want to do that? Well, I did it and it is perhaps one of the most interesting things that I've ever come across in my life. There are three main aspects to entomology uh, when it comes uh, to, to looking at it broadly. And that is human health, because many insects, such as mosquitoes, transmit diseases to humans, such as, for example, malaria, which is responsible for many millions of deaths on an annual basis. The other two aspects are generally crop uh, uh, agriculture associated, i.e. crop protection, stopping the bugs from eating your food, and animal health, stopping the bugs from killing or transmitting diseases to your animals. This course really prepared me well for the next five years at Honest Support as a student, where I met my wife actually. And thereafter, we were veterinarians in the Northwestern Cape as, and working for the state. It was an amazing experience and I wouldn't uh, stop anybody from joining the state because A, you deliver an enormous service to your customers, farmers in that area, mostly sheep, but they really rely on the knowledge of a veterinarian and his or her ability to help them. Then at doing research at Honest Depuert Veterinary Institute was an absolute eye-opener. There I did research on and it worked well with what I've done at Rhodes with on ticks and insects, the direct damage they cause to the animals, 
cattle, sheep, goats, your own pets, and the diseases they transmit. And almost a billion rand a year is spent in preventing the effect of ticks, tick-borne diseases, insect, insect-borne diseases on animals which are our bread and butter, literally, and also our companions. After the 10 years sojourn doing research, I joined the animal health pharmaceutical industry, where I learned a lot about the development of products to protect the livestock and companion animals, as well as the sales and the marketing of vaccines and medicines for the prevention of the diseases and parasites that affect our livestock and companion animals. After working there for a decade again, I started my own company, feeling that I'd learned enough. But what this taught me and the enjoyment it gave me was absolutely enormous. But why really, where does one get one's satisfaction? That's the biggest challenge that we as a world are facing today is the unstoppable growth of the human population. In 2013, the world's population reached 7 billion, an enormous number. And we project that it will be 9 million by 2050. As a result, food production has to double in the remaining 28 years. But, you know, that the wheat, the sunflower oil and other shortages as a result of the Russian invasion of Ukraine has given us a preview of what to expect if we don't rise to the challenge and produce sufficient food to feed the 60 million people plus, or 60 million plus people that are citizens of our country. Food security is the most important goal that we as responsible people, as responsible veterinarians, can focus on. And food security has four, four important facets. Sufficient food to feed all. That's not a complicated concept. The right food, which means that a properly balanced diet is required. You can't just live on popcorn. And research has shown that sufficient protein is critical to ensuring the cognitive abilities and the development of children at school, directly affecting school marks. And this is where the people that came before me today are playing such a big contribution. Meat, milk and eggs play a role that is absolutely critical in our diet. With the fourth industrial red revolution having already begun, people need to use their heads, not their brawn. The third aspect, of course, is affordable food. And that's also not complicated, but it's a measure of supply and demand. And then lastly, safe food. Well, we've seen the effects of the stereosis and some of the other causes of the withdrawal of foods from the, from the shelves of the supermarkets. And this is where technologists, veterinary technologists, medical doctors and veterinarians play a huge role, ensuring that we all have safe food to eat. Stats show that South Africa is already facing a crisis in this regard. I'm not talking about safe food, but food sufficiency in the main. 40% of our children go to school without breakfast. 2011 research, sorry, 2018 research showed that 4.8% of the children in this country are wasted. That's the worst form of malnutrition you can get. Small, small underweight and health damage as a result of insufficient food. 24% on top of that are stunted. And another 
underweight for their age. That means that 40% of South African children suffer measurable side effects from malnutrition. And it's little, there's little doubt that the picture is even bleaker as a result of climate change. The political situation where farmers are threatened with expropriation without compensation, the government's mismanagement of the economy, of COVID uh, or COVID uh, affecting the supply of food, Russian invasion, invasion of Ukraine, and so on. The outbreak of riots in KwaZulu Natal, to my mind, were a symptom of this. And just to put it into interesting words, the much reviled president of the former Apartheid Republic of Siska in his inaugural speech said his government's policy would be to provide a meal a day. And this is what was important to me, and I've never forgotten it. It applies across the board, and we see it daily. Empty stomachs have no ears. And it's farmers, agriculture, who either grow crops or animals or both that produce food for the population. And to do so effectively and efficiently, they have to utilize modern technologies to overcome the challenges faced. Things like droughts and parasites, poor grazing, climate change, and so on. As a veterinarian, there are really wide options for career direction. You can be a private practicing veterinarian in either small practice, a small animal practice, that's pets and companions, or large animal practice, which is the most common choice. However, there are many other options, specializing in many disciplines. And you heard one from Dr. Bauer, ophthalmology, but medicine, pharmacology, toxicology, surgery, and why this is so interesting for me or so important for me is that it enables one to speak to almost anybody. You can speak to a surgeon, to a pharmacist, to an anesthesiologist, to people about animal welfare. You can speak to people about the environment. It makes your life truly interesting. And perhaps as Dr. Bauer mentioned himself again, there's this new concept of One Health which is the intersect of environmental health, animal health, and human health. And of course, food security is a primary example of this. If we don't look after the environment, and if we don't look after our animals, we will not have sufficient food. A very interesting example, and it's really important to mention because it's there at home in the Eastern Cape. 62% of young people in the Eastern Cape who develop epilepsy, develop epilepsy as a result of a human tapeworm. That tapeworm cycles, i.e. the immature cycle, or the immature stages are found in pigs. And if you don't cook your food properly, and it's an infected pig, you get a tapeworm. Because people and pigs are so similar, you can self-infest. You develop a cyst and you develop that cyst in your brain and you develop epilepsy. Veterinarians have developed vaccines which prevent the cysts developing in the pig or treatments to kill the cysts in the pig, thus breaking the cycle. We've spent 40, 400 years basically trying to tell people cook your meat properly, don't just Go and do what you have to do behind the bush. Don't let the pigs eat what you've deposited there. But the message doesn't work. So the, in the intervention medically from a veterinary point of view by breaking the cycle in the pigs is very effective. Other examples of One Health are rabies. <coughs> if you vaccinate cat dogs, you prevent rabies in people. Tuberculosis. Control it in cattle, you do a, go a long way to preventing it in people. Brucellosis is another one. 
what could be more interesting and more satisfying than contributing to world food safety, to animal health, to environmental health, and to human health all at the same time? This is the satisfaction of a veterinarian <clears throat> doing good and at the same time doing well. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for those, Peter. Okay, we're now going to move over to the chat box and we're just going to go through the panelists. A couple of questions have been coming through. Uh, Peter, while you're on the, uh, as the last guest, uh, there's one read, uh, uh, attendee who's basically asked you about your insects, how the locust eradication, uh, what does South Africa do in the case of locusts and what measures do we use? Well, I'm afraid, and I don't like to say this, but, you know, when it comes to the control of pests, it's not something that you just attend to when it happens. Monitoring the hoppers, monitoring the emergence and growth of the population over time is absolutely critical, as is early intervention. What we've done over the past is just let it grow and grow and grow, and all of a sudden, it's a massive problem. Um, at this stage, then, the only op option is chemicals, and one has to choose the chemicals which do the least damage to the environment as a whole. I don't know if I've answered the question, but that's as much as I can answer. Okay, thanks for that, uh, Peter. Um, uh, there's a question come up from uh, Gwen Bathingswaite. Uh, the question, it just says there, what alternative products are visible other than normal beef, pork, I think it is, wheat, etc.? This is a general question for anybody who wants to answer. Um, Mr. Sanford, I can maybe have a, a quick crack at that. I'm not sure if I'll be doing it justice, that question. Um, but the question is, what are viable alternative products to normal beef? pork, wheat, etc. And um, just something that's happening currently in the world, um, being spearheaded in, uh, in Holland at the moment, I think, whether it's ever going to become commercially feasible or commercially viable remains to be seen, but there's already a company in South Africa that's been established to do it. And these companies are growing in a laboratory meat products. Um, or meat, let's put it that way, and then turning that meat into products. So the first um, burger produced with lab-grown beef was uh, consumed, I think, two years ago. Peter, help me if I'm right, two years ago in the UK. And there's yeah. since been some, some uh, commercialization of that in, in Holland and in England. And as I said, there's a company in South Africa that's looking at um, growing growing meat products without having to use the animal. Um, so essentially they're harvesting cells from different breeds of cattle and sheep and pigs, and probably also wildlife. That's where the South African one's coming into being. And they're saying that that product is going to be exactly the same as the original product from, from the animal itself. Um, you can imagine that that would have probably a very big following in countries where animal welfare and non-consumption of animals is being pushed to quite a large degree. I think in, in uh, you know, as you, as you come down the level of development of the, um, of the countries, uh, that probably becomes less important. But where I think it could be important is at some point, um, as, as Dr. Obram has alluded to, at some point the world's gonna gonna tip the scales and and the seesaw is gonna see the other way and saw the other way. And they're gonna be too many mouths to feed with what's left to be able to produce traditionally like what we're doing now. So I'm not sure if that was the question that Gwyn asked and, and if that's what he wanted, um, or whether it was a, a question as to alternative protein sources um, because of what Peter said about protein being so important for the uh, for the nutrition of, of growing children. 
um, other than uh, than meat and wheat. Um, I'm, I'm not 100 percent certain, but I hope I've answered it to some degree. If anyone else would like to come in, obviously, please. Yeah, I think that did answer, Gary. I'm, uh, I know Gwyn's been overseas. I'm sure he just missed the South African meat, and that question's popped up there, but appreciate it. Uh, Darwin, uh, there's a, someone sent a, a question asking him. They, they basically realise you've, you've grown up on the farm and has been a family farm for decades, and you did study agricultural production after school. At what age did you realise that farming was in your blood? And there's a two part. And then secondly, how did your family get involved in cattle farming or ranching up in Zimbabwe? Of all places. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, sorry, Chris, I didn't get all of the all of the question, but I will uh, I'll, I'll answer what I can, and I hope I hope uh, what I say makes sense. Um, yeah. So now, I mean, from 16, probably we worked on the farm here. Yeah? So I mean, we've always been always been involved in cattle. Uh, our environment lends itself to stock farming, and um, I think I think there's quite a lot of negative misconception when it comes to pea farming. You know, when you're using natural resources like most cattle farmers do, that is going to be used by something anyway. So either it'll burn, uh, or it'll be used by game, or it'll be used by cattle. And I, I think the the negative connotations. Uh, on the environment, I think, are a, are a misnomer. Mis How we got involved in Zimbabwe? Well, we've got family there. We were exporting cattle for a number of years. So we've sent cattle to Angola, um, oh, Zimbabwe, uh, Botswana, um, and a number of other places. And we had family that were farming there, and an opportunity came up. And while things are as they are, there's lots of there's lots of ground available, it's quite easy to get into that system at the moment and before the country stabilizes, maybe a good time to get in. Uh, well, we, we haven't seen the positives of that yet, but uh, we are ever hopeful. Uh, but it's a very interesting country, a magnificent country, and we we hope and pray that it does that it does come right. I hope that answered the question. I think so, Darwin. I uh, see there's a question come up from Damien Rose. Uh, he was a past matriculant a couple of years ago, one of my top geographers. Uh, the question here is, what advice would you give in terms of raising the required capital to start a farming operation if your family does not come from a farming background? Would you start with a small holding or would you work one's way up uh, to be economically viable? Chris, I'll, 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 leave that, I'll leave that up to the other panelists, but but all I can say is one way of not to do it is to study vet science because it didn't work for me. <laughs> yeah, I think you've got a couple of options. Um, uh, you've got a couple of options. One, uh, go into business, make a lot of money and, uh, and buy a farm. Two, uh, you're fortunate you, you're in a family farm. Three, is actually get involved uh, in a management capacity on a farm and work your way to a point where you can eventually get profit share. I'd say that's one of the easiest ways, uh, one of the best ways if you've got no capital to, to get in. Um, people are desperate for decent management, and if uh, and if one can find, yeah, one can find a position, the right person. I, I would suggest that's the right route for starters. You're gaining experience on somebody else's checkbook, which is uh, important, and um, and at least it gives you an in. And after a period, you may be able to get profit share in that system. And I, I would actually recommend because uh, you'd come, you'd come onto a farming system actually knowing what you're doing, and I think that's almost most important. Right, thanks for that comment. Uh, Pierre, there's a question here for, for, uh, for you. Uh, it's basically saying after you qualified as a civil engineer, your family business has always been pineapple farming. At what point did you decide you needed to do an MBA, fully understand and realize the business potential in your work environment? Um, yeah, I worked for about three years in engineering, obviously the two years in the army. Um, but uh, the MBA thing was, it's probably more just because a friend was doing it basically. And 
I had a father who could pay for it. I think that's probably that's just a nice thing to do. But it was a great experience. But I mean, it's, it's a difficult thing to A, afford, because you have to have worked first and B, to have the time to do it. So I think that was just a bonus. It wasn't, but also, yeah, because I was coming back into a, a, a big business, I guess. So yeah. That's about it. I think I think I've got out of engineering because I realized that if you if you in, I was civil engineering and you you all over the country. So I, I realized my kids are going to be at about 20 different schools. So that's kind of why I came back to the farm. OK, um, I'm trying to see if there's going to be any other questions coming up. Uh, there's a question here for Nicholas. How do you coordinate the various aspects of your business? So I think you need a highly skilled team of management. Um, you need to be there all the time. Um, unfortunately, the other industry is one industry that you can't um, leave to be run by other people. No matter how competent they are, you've got to have your finger on the pulse from five o'clock in the morning until six o'clock at night um, and then even after hours so i think just a, a highly skilled management team is yeah, the most important factor in, in managing everything okay i think we're just about time up um if i just want to ask any of the panelists if they would want to just end up with a final couple of words each Okay, Gary's waving off there. No, I'm, 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 I'm just putting my hand up. I can't see where to put their hand up electronically. But just, I, I don't know how many of the people watching are actually still at school um, in, in looking at, at this, but probably, a, not probably, a very important thing if you're wanting to get into vet science is already from probably two years before you matriculate, spend as much time as you can in practices close to where you live. It doesn't matter if it's a small animal practice or a large animal practice, but spend as much time as you can with those vets and then get them and then keep a lot of the hours and the days that you spend there. The, the selection process uh, to get into vet science is, is very, very stringent and very difficult. And those, uh, those practical exposures that you have carry a huge amount of weight and swing when you, when you apply to get in. So, if it's not too late for you already, do it as much as what you can. Thanks, Dave, for Gary. Okay, Darwin, uh, do you want us to we'll go around? I'll start with Darwin there. Any final words? Uh, no, thank you. Thank you for the experience. Uh, yes, no, no, none. Uh, there we are. But um, yes, no, no, cheers. Okay, Pierre. Yeah, look, I think the point that Peter made about feeding lots of people is, is important. So there definitely can be opportunities, I think, in agriculture. I think sometimes we are a bit down on ourselves. And agriculture always seems to be um, in trouble, shall I say, politically or whatever. But um, we've got lots of mouths to feed and there are going to be opportunities because of that. And uh, But never criticize a farmer with your mouth full. And that's about it from me. Thanks. Uh, Nick? You still there, Nicholas? Yeah, um, I'm glad I was the curtain raiser to this elite panel. Um, thanks for having me. And yeah, okay. to the to the listeners, um, yeah, no substitute for hard work. And good luck to you all. Uh, Gary. Um, no, just uh, thanks very much for the invite to join. I've really enjoyed it. If uh, if anybody wants to know more about getting into vet science, my you've got my telephone numbers or my email. I'm open to to help as many people as possible. So you're very welcome to contact me privately as well. Uh, appreciate. It. Thanks, there, Gary. Uh, Peter, we're going to end up with you. Well, I must say that I cannot think of any career where one could find as much satisfaction and secondly 
find that it is so interesting because it's so broad, so wide. You have to learn and know anything from insects on the one hand to anesthetics on the other, to if you including um, agriculture as a whole, genetics, fertilizers, nutrition. It's it's such a wide and absolutely interesting uh, career. Choose it. That's all I can say. Oh, thanks, Peter. Uh, we're just going to just close, and I'll just really appreciate and say thanks to the panelists uh, for being on this 150 Jubilee webinar. Um, I think the input we've had tonight, and I'm sure we're going to have lots of viewers on the YouTube. Uh, Darwin, you're famous at last. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> you, you, don't, you didn't know about it, actually. <laughs> uh, typical high school boys. Look at them, they're all high school boys. Peter, you're the only one who wasn't a high school boy. The rest were all high school boys. Uh, but really, I appreciate the time, and I'm sure there's going to be lots of viewers. And uh, I know Alan will be on the, the lines dropping some emails, some old boys. I, I know some present boys definitely will get in touch with one or two of you just a little bit of input as well but really appreciate and thanks very much okay good night to all thanks everyone uh, thanks to everybody